I think it's time to dive in. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with all of you so you can see a PowerPoint that I'm pulling up. And I can't remember if we have the setting set so that you can also see my face or not. Um, but um, let's see. But I'm going to talk and you should be able to see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Great. And it's just happening slowly. There we go. Is any of my screen blocked off by people's pictures of people's faces, Katie? No. Can nope. you see the whole thing? Great. Whole thing. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So this is a, um, a class that I originally did, and it looks like I forgot to change the title um, when I was making this class today, or finishing up the changing some details over. This is a class that I initially put together for our truly fantastic Master Gardener volunteers um, who, who volunteer doing all sorts of um, plant plant-based education and learning things through our office. And so I took this same basic structure um, and just changed it a little bit um, because the master gardeners um, are really all about going out there and teaching other people how things work. So there's parts of it that I've just left in place. So we can, if there's no more explanation that's needed or if there's teachers on the line, um, I have some of those learning um, some of those other learning resources plugged in at the end um, that I initially told Master Gardeners about. Um, so if you if you really want if you want to see some of those learning um, learning resources at the end, let me know. Go ahead and type that into the chat. Okay, so this was the original agenda I did with the Master Gardeners, um, but we're going to do it. It's going to be a little different today. We are indeed going to start with about about an hour. Um, an hour-ish of me um, talking, but it's going to last a little bit longer um, because I'm going to do questions interspersed throughout. Um, and so I'm just going to start by saying that, um, so I actually farmed for, for many years. I farmed for 16 years before um, discovering that I loved agriculture education just as much as I love um, actually, actually farming and growing things. And so soil has always been a really, really big and important part of my life. Um, and it actually has been a really big part of my family's life for many generations. Um, this picture you can see on your screen was not a member of my family, but my great grandfather actually um, was, um, was a farmer, but also um, worked for the government as um, basically the same sort of job that I have now as an agriculture extension agent, helping, helping farmers in South Carolina better understand their soil. Um, and so it apparently runs in the family to, to love soil. Okay. So, um, and actually, you know what, you guys, I just realized that my dishwasher is on in the background. Is that, is that impeding your, um, your sound at all? <laughs> We can't hear it. Great. That's wonderful. It's apparently a really long cycle, and I didn't realize how long of a cycle it was. So, um, okay. I've, I've, hopefully, I'm done distracting myself. I'm going to dive in. So, when I talk to folks about soil, um, one of one of the first um, one of the first questions people usually have is, "What does healthy soil look like?" Um, and really, the answer to that is, it depends. Um, it really depends on where, where in the world you are. Um, we have um, hundreds of different soil types all across, across the world. And what good, healthy, normal soil looks like um, is really place specific. It depends a lot on um, the bedrock and a lot of the, um, the natural, natural systems and um, levels of, of different types of things in your soil. So this is a picture of what good, healthy soil looks like in different parts of the world. Um, you know, and not many of us would look at this picture and pick out any of these as examples of what healthy soil looks like, right? I think as a, as a society in this country, we generally have an idea that good healthy soil is, um, it's dark brown and fluffy. Um, and that's simply not the reality of soil in a lot of the world. Okay, so I, I really like this picture a lot. Um, uh, the picture that you should see, I think, on the far right side of your screen, unless my screen is mirrored, I'm not sure. Um, but this is a, um, an old picture from the southeast um, coastal area of Florida. Um, and there was a machine that was used to literally cut down through the soil, through all of these layers of soil. Um, and it's called a soil pit. Um, these are often dug for the purposes of research. 
um, and they're, they're, they're deep. Um, they're deep, you can get in them, you can get down in these soil pits and actually interact with all these different naturally occurring layers of soil. Um, and so this, this, the picture that you can see here is what soil in the southeast of Florida um, naturally looks like in, in one particular region. Um, and you can see that there's really distinct layers. So that very first picture that you saw, the one of many different kinds of soils um, from different parts of the world, um, all those soils look really different. But one thing they all have in common is that they all have the exact same layers. Uh, and in soil science, we call this um, soil horizons. Um, I don't know why they're called horizons. Um, to me, it's much easier to think about them as layers because that's really what they are um, and they're very predictable. So every soil type around the world starts with that layer on top, which is the surface litter, you know, like things that are just starting to break down on the top of the soil. And then that next layer down is topsoil. So you can see in that picture that topsoil um, in our area or in, in southern Florida is um, pretty sandy, right? So that's, that's really our topsoil layer. Um, and then you go, and, th and that topsoil layer is where most of the root systems are in, in plants. Um, that's, where they, that's where they really stay, because that's where most of the nutrients in the soil hang out. And then the next layer down, you can see in the little infographic next to the picture, is something called the zone of leaching. And that's a really important zone to just like keep in your mind that this layer or this zone exists. Um, and this is the layer in, um, in your soil profile or in that, that really predictable stacking of layers of soil, um, where once nutrients pass through that, that part of your soil structure, plants really can't access those nutrients anymore. They, they pass down through that zone of leaching down into the subsoil and they're, they're pretty much lost to, to plants. Um, and so that's a really important concept to just keep in mind as we, as we make our way through this class today. So I'm gonna um, pause really quickly on this and say, so the way I, I tend to go about teaching is kind of like these layers of soil um, where I'm gonna give you one layer of information um, and just trust that it, that, it will, that it will wrap around and connect with these other layers that I'm gonna give you. And so by the time we're done with this, all of these layers of information that I'm gonna talk to you about today should all connect in and you'll get the full picture, um, the full picture of, of kind of what's happening with soil. So um, just keep typing questions into that chat box if things, as things come up um, and I will stop every 10, 10 or so minutes and um, answer clarifying questions. Okay, so for those of you that live in um, the Sarasota County area or on the, the west coast of Florida in general, the, the, the southwest coast of Florida in general, um, we have a soil, we have many different soil types, but the predominant one is something called Mayaka fine sand. Um, and this is what it looks like in, um, in a soil pit. Um, and you can see those exact same layers, right? Um, and that zone of leaching is that really white zone. Um, and you, you know, once, once nutrients passes through that white zone, um, it's really hard for plants to pull, pull nutrients back out. So I think it's just really neat to see what all of these layers under our feet actually look like. You know, we walk on soil every day, but we don't often think about what's actually under that very top layer. And that, I think it's just a really, it's a really neat way to see what's going on down there and that it's really complicated and in a lot of ways, really, really predictable, which makes it easier to learn about. Um, this is just another picture um, from a different part of the world, um, and I have, and I can't, I can't actually remember where this picture is from, um, but they clearly have a really different kind of soil type than we have in this area. But you can still see those really distinct um, layers, and this is a really deep pit. Um, you know, so some areas have really deep soil horizon layers, and some have really, really shallow. This is an example of a really deep um, soil horizon. This was, um, this was actually just a neat picture um, from a, an international garden festival that happened 15 years ago in Canada. Um, and I, I left this in here just because it's such a neat, um, a neat way to see soil. And I know you can't see the horizons very well, but this is just a snippet of an exhibit that folks did from different parts of Canada where they cut out a soil profile from soils of different parts of Canada and put it on display in these plexiglass boxes so people could walk around and see the soil that they walk 
they walk on top of every day. Um, and so that was an idea that um, the Master Gardeners and I had talked about is trying to create something, something like that in our area so people can have a way to interact more with what's under their feet. Okay. Um, Katie, do we have any questions thus far? We do. We actually just got one in. Um, do plants get any nutrients from the E horizon, the zone of leaching? Yeah, so they, they will get some from that zone of leaching, um, but it depends on your soil type. So in our really sandy soil, not a heck of a lot. And we'll come back around to why that is, why sandy soil in particular um, has um, has such a quick transfer of nutrients through that that zone of leaching. Um, but that's, yeah, so like if plants can, um, if plants and soil particles can catch those nutrients fast enough, some of, some of it is retained from that zone. Um, but things like big heavy rains will wash it through really fast. So, um, and we'll, we'll weave a little more in and around that in a little bit. We got one more question. Okay. What causes such stark differences in soil layers? That's a great question. Um, so different, different things. Um, and we'll, um, some, of the, some of that will get answered as we go. Um, and um, a big piece of that is gonna get answered when we talk more about organic matter later. Um, so that the bedrock layer is simply whatever the, you know, the, the rock that the earth sits upon is made from. And so different parts of the world have a different kind of bedrock, you know, like up in New England, it's granite, um, you know, down here, it's, you know, in a lot of South, South Florida, it's, um, you know, limestone. So that's, you know, that, that really is what that, um, that bottom layer is. And then over time, as though that bottom layer of bedrock, um, um, breaks down a bit, you know, some of that kind of works its way back up. So, you know, soil that has a granite bedrock has more granite in it as a, as a soil. Um, um, but that happens over, you know, millions of years, that, that wearing down of bedrock. Um, and then a lot of that color difference from the top happens um, because it, it depends on what kind of organic matter, um, which we'll come back around to in a bit, what kind of organic matter is breaking down um, and kind of feeding into that soil. So I'm going to um, I'm going to keep going, and I think that those questions will be more fully answered by the end. Um, but those are exactly the kind of questions. Keep keep those rolling, and I'll try to do my best to answer them um, either fully or in part, and then make sure we wrap back around to them by the end. Okay, so. Um, Soil, right? So, like, generally, when we think of soil, we think of a you know, it's it's dirt, it's soil, right? Like, soil is soil, but actually, soil is composed of four really distinct um, categories, and and it's water, air, whatever the mineral part is. Um, so, you know, like whatever that bedrock was made out of, um, and organic matter, and it just so happens that. Um, I know these are really poor quality visuals, but I don't have anything better at the moment. Um, but it's also in pretty predictable, those, those four components are in pretty predictable proportions to each other across soil types. Um, you know, and there, there certainly is variation. Um, you know, so in, in general, um, at your average soil is composed of 20 to 30 percent water. Um, you know, so, you know, obviously right after we get an eight inch rain, um, it's not you know, 20% water that's in there. But, you know, on an average day, an average soil is about a quarter water, about a quarter air, um, which, you know, it's obviously not, not a visible thing, um, but it's what, what makes soil fluffy is that air that's in there. Um, and then soil is about 45% mineral. So in our area, that mineral is what we look at and see as sand um, and about 5% organic matter. Um, and we'll come back around to organic matter um, in a bit. So that's, that's the basic breakdown of if you have a handful of soil, that's about the breakdown of what's actually sitting in your hand percentage wise. And then if you put it under a microscope and really focus in on, you know, like a single, um, single little clump of, you know, tiny, tiny little particulate matter clump of soil, it's actually a whole mashup of, of all of these things, right? So it's, you know, little bits of, um, 
of minerals stuck together with little bits of organic matter and little pockets of air and water and um, it's all it's all mixed together right there it's a very um, it's like you put all these things in a blender um, and, and out they pop okay so I know you can't see this and I don't I don't need you to I'm gonna zoom in on a part of it um, but I want you to see this is kind of um, this is a, a soil testing form so a really good way to figure out um, what sorts of what sorts of things you have going on in your soil in terms of um, nutrients and, and things like that is to actually just send a sample of your soil into a lab. Um, this is what a test result looks like from the University of Florida's testing lab, um, specifically for a kind of pasture grass called Bahia grass. Um, and um, these these test results can be pretty confusing to folks. So I'm gonna to try to go through some of the sorts of things that you might see on a test result um, if you test your soil. Um, and even if you only test your soil one time in your whole life, it's a great idea to just test it that one time. So you have some idea um, on you know, a very microscopic level of what, what's going on in there. Um, and that it just gives you some really good information to work with. So this, um, this right here is, um, a blow up of that one of one section of that soil test form that I just showed you, and um, let's see, Katie, can you see my um, my pointer, like my little mouse thing? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so for Bahia grass, um, this this sample shows that a really good pH. Um, we're about to talk about pH, which is a really, really confusing part of soil, but it's a really important one to understand. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it to you on a soil test, and then we're gonna go back around and actually talk about what is pH and how does it relate to soil, and why is it a really handy thing to know about. So you can see here for Bahia grass, which is a pasture grass that, um, that cattle and horses eat in this area, um, a really good pH is 5.5. Um, and for those, let's see, there we go. You can see it there. Um, and for those of you who know um, anything about soil test results, um, you know that that's, that's pretty low. You know, that's, that's so low that, it, that most vegetable crops won't actually grow particularly well in a pH that low. But that is the pH that this particular kind of grass really likes. So this particular sample of soil that this pasture was growing on had a really low pH. Where'd my little clicker thing go? There we go. They had a pH of 4.7. That's really low. Um, that is like very unusually, unusually low. Um, but it happened to actually fall into a pocket of land where that actually was about the normal pH for that area. And then you can see um, down here at the bottom some different nutrients that are listed out, you know, like phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and how much of it is in that soil. Okay, so. That's basically what you get when you get a soil test, right? And so like, what in the world does all of that mean and what do you do with that information? Well, I'm guessing that this will um, not at all clear it up. So pH is defined as the decimal logarithm of the reciprocal of the hydrogen ion activity AH plus in a solution. That certainly does not clear things up. Nor does pH is the negative log of the concentration of, right? And, and that, you know, at the bottom, you can see that pH scale is logarithmic and therefore pH is a dimensionless quantity. These actually are the definitions of pH, right? Not helpful that none of this, unless you have a chemistry background, um, none of this has cleared a darn thing up. And in fact, it's probably actually added to the confusion, right? So, Here's what you actually need to know about pH. This is what is this is what is actually important, and it is simply that pH affects the availability of soil nutrients. Uh, you know, nutrients may be in your soil in what seems to be the right amounts for for what you're growing, um, but if the pH is too high or too low. Um, there's a chemical um, reaction that happens that actually binds up some of those nutrients to a form that plants can't actually access them. Um, and so that's why it is important to know um, what your pH is. Um, and so let me show you, oh, um, that was not the slide I thought was coming next. Um, so um, I will show you in a slide in just a moment, um, the slide that I, th I thought was coming next. So this, um, I don't know if you can tell, um, 
but this is actually a strawberry plant. And this is not a really neat new variegated variety um, grown for beauty. This is a strawberry plant that is suffering from a very severe nutrient deficiency um, that um, was growing um, on the farm of a producer that I work with in this area. And it took us a little, uh, little figuring out, but we discovered that it was not due to the amount of nutrients that were in um, in her growing medium, it was actually from a very significant pH imbalance. Um, and I'm very curious if any of you um, on this um, on this webinar recognize um, which which nutrient this um, this particular strawberry plant is really low in. Um, if you have a guess, will you will you um, type it into that chat box? I'm quite curious. Um, okay, this is this is what I thought was coming next. Um, okay, so this is a really really great way to look at um, to look at pH and see how it affects diff the availability of different kinds of nutrients. Um, you can see down at the very bottom of the screen that this was actually um, redrawn in 1946. You know, so this is something that um, hasn't changed. You know, in in decades. Um, this is simply the reality of how um, pH affects the availability of nutrients. So, um, you know, for example, let's um, let's go with calcium. Calcium is an important. Um, actually, no. Let's let's um, pick a little right to the top. That's easier to look at. Nitrogen. You can see nitrogen here, um, and you can see that it's on a scale um, up here at the top. It's a pH scale. The, the whole pH scale runs from from zero to fourteen, with seven being neutral. Right. So. This is, this is just part of that pH scale, but anything outside of this scale is, is definitely not, um, not a place that plants can grow of any sort. So you can see that in these more, where'd my little pointer go? All right, I'm having trouble finding my pointer. There it is. Okay, so you see this nitrogen band right here. Um, between about a pH of six and about a pH of eight, nitrogen, there's much more nitrogen available um, than, than it is when the pH is much higher or much lower, okay? Um, so that's, that's really the bulk of what you need to know about that. And these first few um, nutrients that are listed here, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, those are considered the, the macronutrients that plants need. Those are the ones that if you buy, you know, like a generic bag of fertilizer, you'll see NPK written on the bag for nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And, you know, for, for many years, um, we thought that those were kind of just like, those were kind of just the ones that you needed. Um, but it turns out those are the nutrients that plants need the most of. But everything else that you see written on this list, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, boron, copper, zinc, plants need those just as much as they need the, the other, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, they just need it in smaller doses. Um, and so, you know, you can see that the, the macronutrients, those top three, are most available when the soil is relatively neutral. But with some of the micronutrients, those ones that plants need in smaller concentrations, um, they're actually more available in um, when plants, or sorry, when the soil is um, either more alkaline or more acidic. Okay, so I don't have great visuals of what some of these nutrient deficiencies can look like in plants, but um, this is one that I pulled up for, um, for, for master gardeners that they could show to, show to folks who come into our plant clinic. Um, and this is just a great visual. Um, it's a little blurry because the, the actual file size is pretty small, but it's a great visual of um, kind of what what plants look like um, when they have different nutrient deficiencies. You know, so you can, you can see there's, um, you can actually start to read plants and learn a little bit about what's happening under the soil and what kind of nutrients they may be low in. Um, you know, or, you know, you can take a look at soil test results and say, oh, wow, you know, actually my manganese level is totally normal, but because my pH is so far off, um, that manganese isn't available to plants. And there's another one, um, just another example of, um, there's just some really neat, um, really neat resources that are out there on the internet that show pictures of what plants may look like if they're growing in soil that doesn't have quite the right balance of things going on. So there is definitely a 
deficit of really good pictures that show nutrient deficiencies in plants. Um, but this is a, this is a um, you know, it's a blurry but really good picture of corn um, and what nutrient deficiencies look like in corn. You know, these are, these were all grown in soil that had um, not enough of something. So I've got nitrogen deficiency, um, phosphorus deficiency, and potassium deficiency. Right, so those are those are really distinct patterns. Um, so once you start learning what some of those patterns look like, you have a pretty good idea of what might be happening in your soil. Okay, so we're going to really quickly go through some of this because um, this is not as much. This part is going to be not quite as much about understanding your soil as just understanding some of what's in there. Because um, I'm guessing that a lot of the folks that are on this line are interested in this workshop because they are gardeners um, and just want to know more about their soil and how to manage it. So I'm going to pause there really quickly and see if there's questions. We did get one question. Okay. Um, it is, I am growing Louisiana iris, which likes acidic soil. I add my coffee grounds coffee grounds as top dressing. Is this a value? It is, yeah. And so, um, you know, it, it also depends on what pH your soil is to start with. Um, so if you started with really acidic um, soil, um, it, there, there's an off chance that it could be over acidifying. Um, it's not super likely, um, but there is an off chance. Um, and, um, but yeah, it is absolutely a way that you can start to pull down the pH of your soil if you know that it's higher than than it, um, than what you would like it to be. Um, and then coffee grounds are also organic matter, right? They, they, they used to be alive. Um, and so those coffee grounds are actually also adding, adding other really good things into the soil. Um, I'm really excited to talk about organic matter. It's one of my favorite topics and I'm leaving it pretty much to the end. Um, so we'll, um, yeah, we'll learn more about how coffee grounds and things like that add really good things to soil. You good? We're good, thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna really quickly zip through this section. Um, talk, um, talk briefly about some of the, the primary nutrients that, you, um, that your plants need to be, to be good and healthy um, that are found in soil. Um, so nitrogen, obviously this is the one that people think of as like the number one thing that plants need, right? And it, although they need it in very large quantities, it's no less, it's no more important rather than all of the other nutrients that are out there. Um, and so um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read everything that's on the screen because y'all can, y'all can read it, um, you know, but nitrogen is that, that nutrient that we think of as being the number one thing that contributes to green leaves, um, quick growth in plants. Um, but one of the things we don't think about is that nitrogen is really, really important in photosynthesis. And plants do get a lot of um, what they need out of soil, but they actually get even more from photosynthesis, um, which is taking energy from the sun and converting it into, into what they need. And so plants that are low in nitrogen um, can't actually take care of themselves as well. And they can't actually access that energy of the sun as well as they should be able to. So these are some fairly poor quality pictures. I'm working on getting a better stash. Um, but you know, this is, this is a head of lettuce that had the one on the right that has had um, nitrogen completely withheld from it. And you can see what a, an incredible difference nitrogen can make in a plant. Um, things like corn, um, you even get smaller, smaller seed size. Okay, and phosphorus. Um, phosphorus is also really important in photosynthesis, also in the development of roots. Um, and without roots, um, plants can't, without really well-developed roots, plants can't pull all those other important nutrients up out of the soil. That's a picture of phosphorus deficiency um, in a corn field. You can see they just don't look right. Um, that's a little tomato seedling. Um, have you ever, if, I'm guessing some of you have probably seen tomato seedlings that have um, just a really beautiful sheen of purple on them. Um, that's actually a sign of very severe um, phosphorus deficiency. Um, while it is beautiful, it's not at all healthy. Um, <laughs> and um, steps to alleviate that problem are recommended. There's another picture of pretty severe phosphorus deficiency in corn. Okay, so potassium. And you see, once again, photosynthesis is on that list. Um, potassium's, 
potassium, nitrogen, and um, phosphorus are all really important um, for the process of photosynthesis, where plants can then feed themselves. Um, potassium is also really important in disease prevention in plants. There's some more pictures. You can see some, some potassium deficiencies. Yellow shoulders and tomatoes. Um, okay. And then calcium. So calcium, um, just like in people, um, you know, cal calcium is so important for our bodies, creating the structure of our bones. It also is really elemental in creating the structure of plants, um, like their actual like, physical structure is um, very calcium dependent. And it helps to actually pull, pull nutrients um, and store nutrients in different parts of the plant. So really important. Um, and there's a couple of pictures I have in here on calcium that I have in here, and they're both not very good quality, but I wanted you to see um, that this is, this is a cabbage that has something that we call tip burn. Um, and it kind of looks like a disease, right? It looks like something's wrong with it. Well, something is wrong with it. This is a cabbage that is calcium deficient. And same thing, right? These tomatoes appear to have a disease, but it's actually not. It's a calcium deficiency. So sometimes diseases and deficiencies look mighty similar, and it's really hard to know what's what. And so starting with a soil test um, can really help clear up a lot of that mystery. Okay, um, magnesium, once again, really important in, phosphor in photosynthesis um, and many other things. Also makes really neat striped leaves. Not a good sign on a plant. Here's a tomato leaf. And again, this looks like a disease, right? And it's not. Um, this is a nutrient deficiency. Sulfur. Um, it does all sorts of things. Sulfur is a very underrated nutrient. Um, you can see the list right there. Um, this was actually a picture I took um, up in Gainesville a few years ago in one of the research greenhouses. And these two tubs, one of them has enough, um, the, the very green one has enough sulfur and the one that is very yellow um, has, uh, was, uh, had sulfur withheld from it. So, and these are, um, I believe, bean and corn plants in there. Um, so you can see, you know, like withholding certain nutrients really truly does have a very big impact on plants. Even those nutrients we think of as those kind of, um, those minor micronutrients. There's a picture of sulfur deficient corn and a normal corn. And there's a picture of lettuce that's very sulfur deficient. It kind of looks, looks a little strange. Like it looks like something came through and just wiped some of the color off of some of the outer leaves. That's what sulfur deficiency looks like in vegetables like um, lettuce. Um, okay, and iron. Iron is another one of those that is um, definitely under underrated. Um, it's really important for things like plant metabolism, enzyme production, chlorophyll production. These are all really important elements of plants. And does that picture look familiar? That is that strawberry plant from the beginning. So this is a plant that was very um, severely deficient in iron. And this was actually a farm that um, was doing some hydroponic growing and they, they, switched, they switched brands of um, growing medium and test strips um, and they didn't, they, didn't, um, they didn't align anymore. And so they unintentionally ended up um, having a pH of, um, I think around, yeah, there we go, um, a pH of about 8.5 in their, in their hydroponic stackers. And it completely bound up some really important nutrients like iron. Um, and you can see on this little chart that we looked at earlier, um, you know, there's 8.5 pH. And you can see how, you know, how small that iron availability line is on that, that really amazing, very old chart. Um, so I am curious, um, Katie, did anyone, did anyone guess that, that iron was the culprit of this? A couple of irons and a couple of magnesiums. That's great. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so and magnesium deficiency looks really similar. It's just kind of a, a reverse, um, a reverse of color where the, with magnesium, it's the color drains out of, um, out of the veins. So it's like a, a flip flop of what you see here. Um, Nicely, nicely done with whoever, whoever had those, those correct answers. Um, are there other, other questions that have popped up? Not at this time. Okay. 
Okay, so we just talked through pH, um, and really the takeaway with pH is pH simply affects the availability of nutrients. That's the part you really need to understand. You know, I went in, I went in deeper than that just because some people love that background information. Um, but I also wanted to just, you know, highlight that it's, it's, you know, it's complicated and it's not something that we can just guess at. Um, and so if you are having issues, um, getting a soil test is such a great um, starting point. Um, it gives you so much information and it often will clear up some really big mysteries. A lot of folks that um, have spent years thinking they just um, really have a black thumb, turns out just have really, really low or really, really high pH. Um, so get that soil test if you've never done one. Okay, so we just talked through pH, which unto itself is um, is, is confusing, um, but hopefully you have that takeaway of it impacts availability of nutrients. Okay, so I'm gonna add yet another layer deeper into the complexities of chemistry. So, um, and I wanna say before I get going into this concept of cation exchange capacity that just like pH, you do not need to understand the chemistry behind it at all. Um, I'm going in deeper than you need, um, but I know that some folks really like that deeper dive. Um, and even if you have, if you, even if you don't remember a speck of all of this chemistry that we're talking about, um, I'm hoping that what you take away is just kind of the end message of these things. Okay, so um, I know that it has been 20 years since I have taken a college chemistry class. Um, and I'm guessing that um, for some of y'all on the line, it has been um, 20 or, or more years or never, right? So um, I'm going to assume that a lot of people don't remember some of these words um, and you don't need to remember them um, to, to really get what cation exchange capacity is and how it's important in soil. But I'm just gonna talk you through it real quick. So in very brief terms, um, an ion, is an atom or a molecule that has gained or lost an electron, which means that it is either negatively or positively charged. Okay, um, you don't need to understand anything more about that. Just remember, it's just an it's an atom that's floating out there somewhere in the world that's either a negative or a positive charge. So, an anion is the really specific word that's used in chemistry um, to name an ion that has a negative charge. And a cation is um, the chemistry word that is used to um, describe an ion with a positive charge. So most of the soil nutrients that our plants need, um, you know, like pretty much all of those micronutrients and most of the macronutrients, um, plants can access them when they're in that cation chemical um, form. Okay, so you know, like calcium when it's in the um, a positive form, magnesium when it's in that positive form is when plants can actually access those nutrients. Okay, so um, we're, so cat, if you, if you wanna, if you, as we're going through this, if you wanna just equate cation with important, important plant nutrients in your head, you can kind of use those two terms interchangeably for the purposes of what we're talking about today. Okay, so, the cation exchange capacity is a very fancy term that simply, when you boil it all down, what it means is that it's the capacity of the soil to hold on to cations, or, or another way to put that is the capacity of the soil to actually hold on to those nutrients that plants need, okay? So not all soil is created equal. Um, cation exchange capacity or that ability of soil to hold onto nutrients varies enormously across different kinds of soil types. Um, and these words I have here in orange, um, you know, organic matter, clay, sand, those are three, uh, clay and sand are two different soil types. Organic matter is something that's found in, in soil. Um, but the bigger the word, the bigger um, the cation exchange capacity that soil type has, right? So. Organic matter has the ability to hold more soil nutrients than, than pretty much anything else um, that's involved with soil. Um, organic, organic matter has all of these little receptors um, all, all over it that those, 
um, positively, they're in these negatively charged like docking stations, think of it that way, and the positively charged um, soil nutrients literally can just combine with it. Okay, so in the way soil works, um, soil chemistry works, is that a positive and a negative come together like a magnet. Um, positive and positive pushes away from each other and negative and negative pushes away from each other. So you need, um, you need a lot of positive and negative to be in your soil in order for nutrients to actually stick in your soil. Okay, so organic matter holds on to a lot of nutrients. Its ability to hold on to nutrients is huge. Um, clay, which we do not have a whole heck of a lot of down in this area of Florida, um, holds on to a decent, a truly decent amount of nutrients. Um, but organic matter can actually have four to 50 times um, a, um, greater ability to hold on to those soil nutrients than clay does, right? So um, organic matter is clearly quite important. And then you can see in this picture that sand is written very small. And it's because sand has very, very little ability to actually hold on to those nutrients. Its cation exchange capacity is very low. Okay, so take a look at that, um, that diagram we saw in the very beginning again. Okay, so this is how, this is how a few different pieces are gonna pull together right now. So soil, um, so the minerals that are found in, um, in really clay soils, as well as organic matter we just talked about, they attract those nutrients like a magnet, right? And so in those, in those soils that have a lot of organic matter or a lot of clay, the cations or nutrients actually stay in, in that topsoil root zone pretty well. They're not particularly easily lost through leaching down through that zone of leaching that we looked at earlier. But sand particles, um, they just don't really grab onto nutrients. And so they very quickly pass through the topsoil layer, through the zone of leaching, and down to the subsoil. Okay? So for, for anyone that wants a, a deeper, um, like a really good deeper dive into cation exchange capacity and how it all works in your soil. Um, UGA has a really great, I think it's maybe four or five page um, resource called the cation exchange capacity and base saturation. Um, it's a document. So if you just um, plug into your internet search engine, cation exchange capacity and base saturation UGA for University of Georgia, um, it's the first article that pops up um, and it's quite handy. Can you okay. Repeat that one more time, and I'll put it in the chat box, Sarah. Yes, ma'am. It is the cation exchange capacity and base saturation UGA. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, I recognize that for most folks, that was way too much information. Some folks, that was probably the right amount. So for those of you um, for whom that was way too much information and for whom chemistry was way too many years ago, um, this, this is really um, the important pieces to pull together. Okay, so cation exchange capacity also interacts with pH. And the cation exchange capacity, that ability of soil to actually hold on to nutrients, decreases as pH decreases. So those really acidic soils, um, for multiple reasons, have a lot of trouble holding on to soil nutrients. So for our region, um, you know, like this myaka fine, um, fine sand that you can see in the, um, in the soil pit picture um, on your screen, what all, all of this that we just talked about, all these confusing chemistry terms, really what all this means is that the combination of very sandy soil, low organic matter naturally in our soil, and low pH adds up to soil that just doesn't hold on to nutrients very well. Um, and so for most of us, unless we're like really like right on the coast um, where soil pH actually is a bit higher, um, for most of us, in, in quite a bit of Florida, um, we have soil that just doesn't like to hold on to nutrients. And that's a really, really important thing to know um, as you're figuring out 
the best ways to approach, um, you know, managing your, your garden um, or your yard or, um, you know, your farm or your ranch or whatever it might be is just always remembering that, um, that no matter how many nutrients you pump into that soil, um, it's simply going to drop out down through that zone of leaching really fast because there's just not a whole lot to hold on to it. Okay, do we have any questions that have popped up with that, that stretch, mm -hmm. Katie? Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm not <yeah>. surprised. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's first off a couple questions about where they can get their soil tested. Yes. Good question. I actually forgot to put it in here because um, I initially um, made this for the master gardeners who um, in our office who provide that information to people all the time. So they already knew the answer to that question. Um, so there's a few different places. Um, right, right now, our office, uh, so let me back up. Our office usually um, can test for um, pH and the salt level in soil. Um, at the moment, we cannot um, simply because of, um, you know, office closure um, related to, um, to the current pandemic. Um, but normally, you know, at the very least, we can, we can test for that in our office. Um, and you just bring in um, a soil sample um, and it gets tested right there in-house. Um, so there are actually hundreds of labs across, soil testing labs across the country that you can send soil tests to. Um, one of them is the University of Florida's soil testing lab. Um, they're up in Gainesville. Um, so um, we can send you, we can send you the link to that. It's very hard to find on the website, um, but um, we, we'll, we'll send a follow-up email to everyone when this webinar is finished. And um, we will include a link to the University of Florida soil testing forms. Um, and at the University of Florida and most soil testing labs across the country, you can test for all sorts of things, not just pH and um, salinity. Um, you can test for you know, micronutrients, macronutrients, um, levels of organic matter, all sorts of good things. Um, and if you're if you're doing a soil sample for the the first time, um, I would if if you have um, if you have the ability, I would just go ahead and do the whole the whole spectrum so you know what you're starting with. Okay. Other questions, Katie? We did get one more, which she said you pretty much answered, but uh, we got a question about someone who lives on a sandbar, Cape Cod. Um, and she wanted to know if she needed to add organic matter every single year to her garden. That's a great question. Um, the answer to that is probably yes. Um, a sandbar in Cape Cod is going to um, wear down really quickly. The organic matter level is going to wear down really quickly. Um, and actually, I, I actually farmed for many years in Maine, which has an extremely different um, soil type than here. Oh, I'm getting those strange squiggles again. Um, Kevin, um, do you see... The strange yellow lines that have just popped up on my screen again. Thank you. I um, apparently, y'all, there's something that I do when I'm doing these webinars. I apparently push some button I am not aware of, and then I end up with um, scribbles that look like they were done by a three-year-old all over my presentations, and then Kevin fixes it for me every time. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, Kevin. Um, and don't be concerned Make about sure. strange scribbles. Those were, those were done by me. Um, yeah, just a okay. quick jump in, Sarah. It looks like yes. you're hitting the, uh, the whiteboard function when you do that. The whiteboard, and I have no idea why. Not a clue. Um, we will have to figure out how, how I am doing that later. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't see, any, I don't see that as a, as a function option, so I just don't know how I do it, but I do it. I do it consistently. Um, okay, so yeah, so let's dive in and talk about organic matter. Because um, regardless of what your soil type is, where, um, where in the world you are, um, you know, what your winters are like, what your summers are like, the intensity of, you know, rain or, um, you know, ice or whatever it may be, organic matter is an incredibly important and very underrated part of soil. Um, so the, the easiest way to think about organic matter is that it is anything um, that is or once was alive. Um, so, you know, basically plant and animal material. Um, and when I say animal, I mean, you know, everything from, you know, bacteria through, you know, baobab trees. Um, and no, sorry, a baobab tree is not an animal. Elephant is a much better, <laughs> much better example. Um, a tree is not an animal. 
a lot of animals that live in trees, um, but they are not animals. Um, you know, so it's, you know, things like seaweed, earthworms, um, manure, um, compost, you know, all, all of those things are organic matter. Um, any, any, truly anything that once was or is alive is organic matter. So this is a great, um, a great way to see kind of what organic matter is all about. And this is from uh, um, a website called soilsforteachers.org. Um, if you are a teacher on the um, tuned into this webinar, webinar right now and you don't know this resource, I would recommend um, checking it out. They've got really great resources um, all about teaching teaching soil for like kindergarten through high school, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, and this is one of the images directly off of, of that website. Um, and they have lots of other teaching tools like it. So this is um, this is what organic matter is composed of. Um, you know, so if you take all the organic matter in soil and, and break it down um, into kind of how broken down it is, how alive or, or broken down, um, at any given moment in time, your average soil, about 5% of that soil organic matter is, um, is actually alive. It's still living, right? It's, you know, it's things we can see like worms or, you know, tunneling, um, tunneling insects. Um, uh, but it's also, thing, most of it is actually what we can't see. Um, it's all the, the micro, um, microscopic life in soil. And then about 10% of soil is that fresh residue. And so this is, you know, most of what we're talking about right now is the stuff that's sitting on that top layer of soil. Um, that top layer that we, um, as a culture, have a tendency to like, you know, rake away um, and put um, and put on our street corner to be hauled to the dump. Um, but that's actually a really, really important part of soil. Um, and it's, it's what creates soil organic matter. And then you have matter that's, act, that's actively decomposing. And that's generally about between a third and a half of, of soil organic matter. And then about a third or a half is stabilized. It's stabilized into a form um, that plants are actually starting to be able to extract nutrients from. Okay, so this is another, if you are a teacher um, kind of slide, but also it's just a really, it's a really great slide. So the the, um, the NRCS is um, a branch of um, the USDA. So the USDA is the United States Department of Agriculture and NRCS is the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And um, they, the NRCS works a lot with, um, with farmers and ranchers doing um, all sorts of projects that help improve the quality um, um, of, of soil and natural resources and things like that. And they happen to recently um, uh, roll out a really great series of infographics with things like this, that there are more soil microorganisms in a teaspoon of healthy soil than there are people on the planet. That's, that's pretty phenomenal, right? And those soil microorganisms are um, a really big part of organic matter. They are also the part of organic matter that breaks down um, things that are larger than them and breaks down plants. So without without constantly feeding those microorganisms, the whole system starts to, starts to break down. Um, and so feeding those microorganisms is a really important part of healthy soil. And organic matter is not just this place that microorganisms live. Um, it's also this just incredible, incredible part of soil. Um, that holds on to water and it holds on to nutrients and it holds on to all of those things that plants and other life forms in soil need to continue living and thriving. Um, and I don't know if you remember in the very beginning, and it looks like I forgot to put it back in here, um, but we talked about what percentage of, of that construct of soil is organic matter. You know, it's like 25% is air, 25% is water, 45% is minerals. That leaves only about 5% of what we think of as soil as being composed of organic matter. In this region, with our extremely sandy soils, um, some areas actually have less than 1% organic matter. And then there's parts of the Midwest with that incredibly rich, deep, fluffy black soil um, that have organic matter levels that are over 10%, right? And so just that alone, um, you can, you can, um, you know that there's some soil that, that functions differently than others. So 
truly one of the most important functions that um, that organic matter has in our soil um, or as a part of soil is that it this is the, really the part of your soil that's managing water like a sponge. So when we get a lot of rain, this is the part of soil that soaks it up really fast and holds onto it and then slowly lets it go as, as needed, just like a sponge. Um, this is another great NRCS infographic um, that talks very, you know, very, very well captures um, or very accurately captures how incredible organic matter is. And so you can see right here on the screen that healthy soil, um, that for every 1% increase in organic matter, you get 25,000 additional gallons of available soil water per acre. That's a lot. That's a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, you know, and so in soils that are very, very low in organic matter, um, those soils simply don't hold on to water very well. And so in our region, that's a double-edged sword, right? Because we get very heavy rains. And so after a very heavy rain, it's re in some ways it's very handy that our soil doesn't hold on to that water very quickly. It, it, it moves really quickly through, our, um, through all of those layers of soil um, and so that we don't end up with just you know, huge amounts of standing water for weeks on end. But it's that's all that the double edged sword piece of that is that because water moves so quickly through our very sandy soil, it does two things that are not as great. Um, it, it takes nutrients with it straight through that zone of leaching. So every time we get a really heavy rain, those soil nutrients that were not already attached somehow to a soil particle like, like organic matter particle, they just wash straight through um, beyond where plants can access them. And then in the parts of the year where we don't get a lot of water, or we don't get a lot of rain here, our soil is very, very dry. Okay, so soil is alive um, and it is organic matter that is, that is what makes soil alive, okay? Um, soil is alive is synonymous with organic matter. It's incredibly important. So another thing that is so important um, about soil organic matter is that it's, the, it's the, the soil organic matter that actually creates that space um, for air. You know, 20, about 25% of soil is air. Um, and it's, that or, it's the organic matter, things like worms, um, tunneling beetles, um, little microbes tunneling through that actually create the space for that um, for that air that's so important in our soil. Um, and I love, I, um, I learned um, when I was doing a little bit of research for this, this presentation together, that um, in 1881, um, when Charles Darwin published his book called The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms with Observations on Their Habits, um, I learned that during his lifetime, this book was actually a better seller than, um, than the book that he wrote about um, evolution, which is you know, pretty incredible. So, you know, about, about 140 years ago, this was an extremely hot topic. Um, and I love this quote from within, within that book, which is, it may be doubted if there are any other animals which have played such an important part in the history of the world as these lowly organized creatures. Um, and he was talking about worms in, um, in, in that quote. Um, so, you know, we, worms are the, the easy, obvious thing to see in soil, um, but there's so many other um, living organisms in soil that are actively creating that really important air space in soil. And so keeping them well fed um, is really important. Okay, um, do we have any questions, Katie? Oh yes, we do. <laughs> okay. The first question we have is, I use atomic grower on the leaves to help with growth. What do you think about that? I don't actually know what atomic grower is. All right. Yeah. And we'll circle back around with that person and get some more information. And Sounds great. That, the next question is, when I purchase a good quality of bagged compost, does this count as hummus, aka stabilized organic matter? Yes. Um, and so um, I want to quickly um, differentiate between hummus and humus. Um, my best friend in high school <laughs> used to make a lot of fun of me for eating um, ground up chickpeas, which are called hummus. She thought it was totally gross and she could never get the word right. And she always called it humus. Um, and so hummus um, is ground up chickpeas. Um, 
humus is that that decomposing layer on the on the surface of your soil. Um, both of them are, are very, very good things in life, um, but are, are quite different. Um, so um, yeah, so bagged, bagged compost. Um, yep, so bagged compost indeed is a really good um, source of organic matter. Um, and again, not all bagged compost is made equal. I have definitely purchased bagged compost in the, in the past and been shocked to discover that it's about 50% sand. Um, we don't need more sand down here. That's not something that we are in need of. We've got plenty of that. Um, you know, but if you're in a part of the country that has really, really dense clay soil, um, adding a sandy compost is, you know, it's not a bad idea. That actually helps to kind of, um, can help to actually break up that soil a little bit and create a little more air space in there. Um, but um, yeah, you know, not all compost is, um, is created equal for sure. Um, and a little tip, so if you are buying um, bulk compost you know, from a landscaping company or something like that um, in Florida, and I'm not sure about other areas, um, you can actually request a, um, a soil, test, um, soil test results from that batch of bulk compost that you're purchasing. Um, companies that are selling bulk compost are supposed to have that at hand and provide it to you. Um, and they, they have to do it in a, in a um, legit laboratory with official results. Um, so you can, you know, you can see, you know, what, you know, at the pH level of that compost you're buying. Um, some of them will test for organic matter, some don't. Um, but if they do, and it, and it's pretty low organic matter, um, it's a pretty good bet that there's a lot of mineral mixed in with it, like a lot of sand. Um, but in, in general, um, bagged composts are a, a, great, um, a great source for a garden of, um, of organic matter. And remember too, things like um, grass, leaves, um, Spanish moss down here, um, you know, all of those sorts of things, that's organic matter. It's just, you know, still in its living form. So as soon as you cut it, you can, you can start layering it on your garden um, and it will break down. Um, you want to... Um, Yes, are there more questions, Katie? Yes, there are. So just so you okay. know, the Atomic Grower is going to email you. So she'll perfect. Go around with you. Perfect, next, perfect. So the next question is, does seaweed add to the salt problem? So it, um, this is a little bit of a it depends question. So if you know that you already have really salty soil, um, and most of the country does not. Um, the two reasons that you would have, the two biggest reasons you would have really salty soil. Um, one is that um, it's soil that has been over, um, over fertilized for many years, um, especially um, fertilizers that are really high in nitrogen. It can actually start to build up some really problematic salts in your soil. So over, there's many, many reasons to not over fertilize. And that's one of them is that you actually kind of, um, you're doing yourself and your soil a big disservice. Um, so that might be one reason that your salt levels are elevated in soil. Um, another reason is that you live very close to the coast and you are either, you either have some salt water intrusion um, coming up through the water table in your soil or, um, um, what was I going to say about that? Something else. Oh, or if you live so close to the ocean that you're getting some saltwater spray, you may already have some elevated salt levels in your soil. Um, and actually, I'm going to take this off the screen share real quick, just so I can see people's faces a little bit. Um, so um, if you know that you already have salty soil, there's a couple of different routes you can go. One is that you can just skip skip the seaweed, skip fresh seaweed. And the other is you can actually rinse that fresh seaweed um, to rinse the salt right off of it. Um, so if you're buying like a, a bottled seaweed product, there's, there's lots of um, companies that actually sell um, like a bottled sea, like liquid seaweed. Um, that, those do not have elevated salt levels um, and they have all sorts of fantastic micronutrients in them. Um, I love using fresh seaweed on gardens when I live close enough to actually access it. Um, and um, it, I, I have never personally dealt with soil that had an elevated salt level. And so I actually don't rinse my seaweed um, before I use it and put it on gardens. Um, I mulch it, mulch it thick. Um, and um, that all of that salt, like that sea, like that literal sea salt is incredibly full of all sorts of micronutrients. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty fantastic stuff. Um, and, um, but it breaks down and it breaks down really, really fast, you know, so it very quickly becomes very available um, nutrients to plants. 
Does that sufficiently answer, answer that? Yep, that is good. Okay. The next question, which I'm going to spell one of the words to you so that I don't butcher it as well. Okay. Is it worthwhile to add my, and the word is my, my core, M-Y-C-O-R-R-H-I-Z-A-E. Um, yep, mycorrhizae. <laughs> yep, that one exactly. Is okay. it worthwhile to add that to the soil? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, and this is another great it depends question. So, so mycorrhizae, um, okay, so um, let's step back a couple steps. So um, I, I thought about actually putting, putting this into this workshop. So I'm gonna try to explain it, explain a little bit without some visual backup to it. So um, there are, um, so plants, plants and microorganisms have um, very necessary relationships. They depend on each other um, in, in our like in natural systems, right? Um, you, can't, you can't have good healthy microorganisms in your soil without like a symbiotic relationship with plants and vice versa, right? So if you, if you want to be working with, you know, natural, natural systems, natural soil, um, it's really important to make sure that both of those things are getting what they need. And so some of, um, so we've actually, we've got plants, um, fungi, and microorganisms. And all these, these are all three of these things actually um, are very interrelated, interconnected. And if you take one of them out of the system, things start to fall apart really quickly. So mycorrhizal um, fungi um, and mycorrhizal bacteria, um, they basically, um, See, it's hard. It's, this is a hard one for me to explain without um, some visuals to show you what's going on. But the, the basics of it is that plant um, plant roots have associations with microorganisms, and they have associations with fungi, and they get what they need from each other. You know, like they they literally will pull nutrients from one um, into the other. Um, and so there are certain kinds of bacteria um, that live in these little nodes in the, in the root systems of certain kinds of plants that can actually take nutrients that are in a form that plants can't access and they can chemi they basically chemically alter the, the form that those soil nutrients are available in. They actually take atmospheric nutrients and turn them into a form that's available to soil, uh, to, available to plants. And then plants can pull those nutrients up and use them. And in exchange, um, bacteria and um, bacteria and fungus and things like that, they pull, um, they pull sugars out of plants. So they literally feed each other. So that's, that's the background to getting around to answering the question. Um, so certain Certain associations are very, very specific, like a very specific kind of bacteria and a very specific kind of tree or a very specific kind of um, fungus that associates with a very specific kind of shrub, you know, for example. Some are a little more generalist. Um, and so if you are ordering um, mycorrhizal, um, you know, fungi or um, you know, some sort of um, beneficial microbes or something like that to add to your soil. It's really important to do the research to make sure that what you are spending your money on um, actually makes sense for what you're using it for, right? So some types of, um, some types of um, packaged, you know, packaged um, uh, beneficial, you know, microbes or things like that just aren't going to work in your soil type um, because they just were not meant to have, you know, the associations that they would have in your soil type. So it really depends, um, you know, and so one thing I think is really important to remember is that um, the best way to really like inoculate your soil with the good stuff is to make sure you're really focusing on building up organic matter in soil. And we'll talk a little bit more about how, how that happens um, in just a moment. Um, but, you know, like, like compost or vermicompost or things like that, um, feeding your soil with that, those, I mean, compost is chock full of microbes and fungus and all sorts of good stuff. And so just using compost um, unto itself is a great way to inoculate your soil with really good things. Um, 
you know, without buying a package product. You know, and that being said, there are some package products that are really, really handy. Um, you know, like um, things like green beans will grow a whole lot better um, if you purchase the correct um, mycorrhizal um, um, fungal inoculant to go with it. Um, you'll get you'll get much better germination, much better production. Um, so that's the that's the very long winded answer to that. <laughs> um, do we I have been fully exposed my lack of agricultural background? Okay, the We're next question that came in. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we had a Master Gardener display garden that tested to 14% organic material. Do wow, you organic matter? matter of concern? What was that last part? Do you consider this a matter of concern? Um, is it in Florida? I'm not sure. So is it in Florida? Is it in a raised bed? Those would be my first two questions. So if it is, you know, if if your question is coming, we this is kind of exciting, y'all, too. We, we noticed that on um, a lot of the email addresses that were coming through, we think that, that we have people from all over the country tapped into this. So I'm trying to make some of my answers a little more general than I normally would. Um, this so, is for Pennsylvania, not Florida. Pennsylvania, okay. So um, I had a feeling that was not someone from Florida. <laughs> so, um, and a ground it would, bed for you. What was that? A ground bed. Okay, great. So that's that's a really impressive level of um, organic matter in Pennsylvania. That would not be um, that would not be so surprising somewhere like Iowa, um, but you know, for, for Pennsylvania, that is high. Um, and so um, you know, I don't have really good um, Pennsylvania specific knowledge. Um, so that would be a great question to ask someone from you know, like the soil science department at Penn State or something like that um, to see what they think of that because that is that's definitely unusually high um, especially for an in-ground bed. You know if it's a raised bed where you're just very intensively building 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 in one really contained spot not so surprising. Um, you know like compost is extremely high um, if, it's, if you're growing in straight compost, it's extremely high in organic matter because it basically just is organic matter. So down here in Florida, if you were to have a level that high, I would probably recommend that you retest your soil um, because that, you know, or ask you if it happened, if you happen to take that soil sample out of the swamp because um, really mucky, marshy, swampy areas have very high um, organic matter levels. Um, there's actually one soil type down here um, in our county um, that you see in just small little sections um, that are in literally in like swamp areas um, and it's a soil type called gator gator muck um, which is my favorite soil type name I have ever heard and it has um, an organic matter of around 75 percent which is extremely high but that's why it holds water that's why it's a swamp um, it's, it's so high in organic matter um, that that water basically just sits there. Um, so yeah, I know that was not like spot on answer to that question, but I would recommend that since you're in Pennsylvania and that does seem a little, a little high, um, maybe, maybe just talk to a soil scientist. Um, and the reason that, some, that, that sometimes, um, sometimes it's not great to have like extremely high soil organic matter um, is that because when we do have, you know, big rain events and things like that, um, because that soil organic matter is holding so much nutrient in it, it can wash wash down and through if we have a big enough rain event, and then you get some like nutrient loading, um, you know, in water tables and things like that. Um, but probably okay. But I would check with someone in that area. Okay. Anything else? Oh yes, we we got a whole bunch of them. <laughs> okay. The next question is going to be: mulch is available from many different sources. Is there one kind or another that's better in providing organic matter to sandy Florida soil as it decomposes? That's a great question. I'm going to go back to screen share. Um, I think I have three more slides. I think the three slides in is where I actually address that. And if if not, if I'm if I'm misremembering, um, I will specifically address that. Sound good? And then I'll I'll take some more questions in a minute. Perfect. Let's see. Okay. Hmm. There we go. Okay. So um, this is this is a picture. When I look at it, um, my whole my whole body tenses up. This is a really stressful picture to me um, for many reasons, including that it would be a pretty it would be pretty unpleasant to be standing in the middle of this field, right? And I'm I'm guessing that that most of you would also feel 
um, a little hesitant to go stand yourself in the middle of a dust storm. Um, so one thing that, um, and this wraps around into that question that was just asked about mulch, is that bare soil loses its organic matter much faster than soil that's covered. And when we see soil blowing in the wind, um, you know, like, like you can see in this picture, for the most part, what you are seeing is organic matter. It's become windborne and it starts to blow away. Uh, and I love this picture immediately following the previous one um, because it's so calm, right? And I really love this picture of a forest. Um, this is a, a forest in New England um, because, um, you know, and this, could, this could be a forest anywhere. It just happens to be a picture of a forest in New England. Um, but forests entirely take care of themselves, right? They don't require human intervention um, to get to have everything that they need for continued and sustained life. Um, and the really, you know, a really huge piece of that is that there's, there's almost never bare soil in a forest, right? It's always covered. And so all those nutrients um, just keep cycling through. Um, the soil temperature is really stable. The soil microbial life is really stable. It's just a really stable system. But for those of us who actually want to be growing food, um, you know, you can, there, there are some foods you can grow in a forest, but we will certainly not, you know, feed humanity from a forest. Um, we can supplement humanity from a forest, but it's not going to be our sole source of food. So I love this picture. Um, and so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how um, I learned to farm in Florida, um, which goes along with this picture. So I farmed for 14 years in Maine. Um, and then uh, about four years ago, I moved down to Florida. And I, um, somebody, somebody um, hired me. And I'm so glad they did um, to manage a new program on campus at the University of Florida called the Field and Fork Farm and Garden Program. And this main farmer had to figure out really darn quick how to farm in Florida. And um, lucky me, I had um, 10 acres on campus to experiment with. And three of them were in a very um, established kind of garden area that had you know good soil and good systems and things like that. Um, and then I had a seven acre site um, that really kind of needed some like re-envisioning and rethinking and recreating. And I was like, well, I know how to farm, but I do not know how to farm in Florida. And I had to figure this out really quickly. Um, and what I was hired to do was basically create a teaching and learning farm for students um, and working with professors to help help them um, by setting up demonstrations of if you if you grow it this way compared to this way compared to this way. Um, and so I really quickly got an, an amazing crash course in how to farm in Florida by creating um, these systems where I would grow the same thing side by side um, in like five different ways. And then we could see how those different things grew and what, what worked and what didn't. Um, so I was learning right alongside with my students, which was a pretty wonderful thing. And I love this picture. So these are um, two beds of lettuce. Each bed has three rows in it. This is from the teaching farm that I managed that year on campus. Um, it's the same variety of lettuce um, taken from the same trays, planted on the same day, the same amount of fertilizer. They got the same amount of water. Um, and you can see there's like three black lines that run next to the heads of lettuce on the, the bed that doesn't look so good. Those same three lines, those are called drip irrigation. They're just like a little dripping, um, they're like a flat irrigation tube um, that drips water right at the base of the plants. Um, so the same three lines are also under the fully mulched bed of lettuce. So they got, you know, exactly every, everything about how we treated these two beds of lettuce was exactly the same. The only thing that was different was that we fully mulched the bed on the right the day that we planted it, and we did not mulch the bed on the left at all. And you can see a very stark difference in these two beds of lettuce, right? Like this is this is not a yeah maybe they look different. Like these are these are two really different beds of lettuce. They look they look almost unrelated. Um, and the first thing you probably notice is that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of space that's actually just not, that doesn't have lettuce in it on, on the left. And that's because the, the seedlings were so stressed when we planted them into that incredibly hot bare soil that they died, 
we couldn't actually salvage them. Um, and then you can see some of the plants seem to be kind of shriveled and just didn't grow right. And that's because they had disease issues from being stressed. Um, and you can also see that the, the, the unmulched plants are smaller um, and they're less glossy. Um, what you can't see in this picture is that the leaves were also really tough, um, like the actual texture of them was tough and they were bitter compared to the, the beautiful heads on the left, uh, excuse me, on the right. Um, and then we would, we weighed quite a few of these heads side by side and we actually got almost double, double the weight um, per head on the, the heads on the right. And really all, all this just comes down to keeping that soil covered. Um, and so we happened to use mulch straw because that's what we had for this particular experiment. Um, and, um, and it worked, you know, it, it worked great. And so mulch straw, of course, used to be living. So not only is it covering that soil, but it's organic matter. So as it breaks down, it's feeding back through that cycle and actually building up better soil in place. So there's a few reasons why mulch, regardless of what kind of mulch you use, is so, so helpful and so important for the healthier soil. Um, one is that it helps to actually stabilize the temperature of soil, right? So um, think about walking um, on the beach on a really hot, sunny day barefoot. It hurts, right? It's actually a painful <laughs> experience. Um, and that's because bare soil heats up so hot um, that it's that it actually is damaging. It damages the bottom of your feet. It's just as damaging to the soil, soil microbial life and the root system of those plants. And so mulching helps to, you know, think about walking on grass on that same hot sunny day. You can walk on grass just fine, right? And so mulch, mulch really helps to moderate the soil temperature. Um, mulch also helps to keep soil from splashing up onto plants. Um, a lot of the diseases that, um, that cycle through gardens are actually stay in soil and then they transfer to the plants, not through the root systems, but by splashing up onto the leaves of plants. So if you cover the soil, you don't get a lot of splash um, and that's great. It also obviously keeps the weeds down. Um, and it helps to moderate water that, you know, as it's, um, you know, things like um, things like mulch straw help to actually soak up some of that excess water and prevent washouts when we get a heavy rain. So let me see if I, oh, I don't. So sorry, I thought that I had a slide in here about the types of different types of mulch that you can use. Um, so there's a couple, and sorry about that, I really thought it was in there. Um, but in terms of the types of mulch that are good to use, um, again, this is one of those um, like it depends kind of scenarios. So a lot of folks that are really um, hesitant to use things like, um, you know, pine straw that they're raking up for their yard because they think it'll acidify their garden soil too much. Um, and it actually generally doesn't as long as you don't ever um, incorporate it into soil. If you just leave it up there on the surface of the soil, it works pretty well as a mulch. Um, things like mulch straw or hay um, are a, a really fantastic mulch. Um, the one thing you need to, well, two things you need to be really careful about. One is that um, they will sometimes contain a lot of um, seeds for weeds. And so you might actually end up um, adding new weeds to your garden um, more than you're actually suppressing things. Um, but especially down in the southeast where so many of the weeds that grow in pastures are actually toxic to livestock, um, producers in the southeast, um, producers of hay and straw are much more likely to use persistent herbicides that will actually hold up even on hay and straw for like two years um, than they are in the northern tiers of the country where we don't have a whole lot of toxic weeds that grow in pastures. Um, so if you are, um, if you're sourcing your hay or mulch straw um, from a southern source, um, just know that there's, you know, th there's definitely a possibility that you're going to have some herbicide residual on that mulch straw um, that, that may persist in your soil for a couple of years and prevent you from growing any kind of annual, um, annual crops. Um, and when I, when I say crops, I, I, think, I think of life in terms of crops. Um, you know, I don't grow one head of lettuce, I grow 10,000 heads of lettuce. Um, but when I say crops, just think of, you know, your backyard garden. Um, so that's, that's just, just, just a thing to keep in mind. Um, and um, 
you can, um, you know, ask ask the folks that you're purchasing it from. You may or may not get get a um, a straightforward answer because they they may not know. Um, they you know oftentimes the folks that are selling straw are not the people who actually grew it. Um, one of my favorite mulches to use down here in the deep south is actually um, Spanish moss. Um, it you know falls right on out of the trees, and we we tend to pick it up and shove it in a yard waste bag and put it on the street corner and it gets hauled to the dump. Um, but it actually makes a really good mulch. Um, and you don't have to worry about it containing, you know, things like persistent herbicide or weed seeds. Um, I, I love it. Um, so um, as a general rule of thumb, if you are growing um, annuals, you know, things like lettuce or kale or tomatoes, using, um, using a kind of mulch that is not woody. Um, so like not bark mulch. Um, and the reason for that is that certain, as we were talking about earlier, certain kinds of microbes and fungus um, associate with certain kinds of decomposing plants over others. Um, and so the kinds of um, healthy soil microbes and fungus that associate with things like um, dead, dead grass um, or, or you know, things like that, um, are the same sorts of microbes that do really well with other annual crops that that, that die quickly. Um, but if you're trying to figure out something to mulch your um, like your fruit trees with, they they like to be mulched with something similar to themselves. The soil microbes like decomposing like woody matter. So things like bark mulch or wood chips. Um, or like you know a thick leaf litter layer those sorts of things so just think about what it is that you're growing and try to match that kind of mulch more or less um, because you'll you'll start to really invigorate some really good fungal and microbial associations by using the right general like category of mulch so woody plants use woody mulches non-woody plants like like annual vegetables use non-woody mulches does that make sense? Um, and Katie, are there questions? Okay. Yep, other questions. The next one's going to be, my banana trees have gotten so many good things in the soil, including organic matter. However, the bananas are so, so small. Any suggestions? Um, are you, um, so one thing that may be making those bananas small um, is um, over watering. Um, I'm assuming I'm assuming you're somewhere very southern. Um, either that, or you're growing bananas in a, in a pot in a greenhouse or something like that. Um, so one one thing that I've actually seen a good little bit in this area is people doing ex exactly what that that um, that question writer just described. You know, like good organic matter, good um, amount of soil nutrients. You know, like, like all those sorts of things. But then a tendency to um, to really overwater. And overwatering um, can actually both change the soil chemistry so that it's um, it's locking up some of those nutrients, but also pushing a lot of those nutrients through the soil so that they're actually not available and washing out some of that organic matter. So that that may be what is happening. Um, it, might, it might not be, but I that's something that I see a lot around here is a tendency to really overwater, and we have soil that's really sensitive to overwatering down here in the deep south and sandy soils. Okay, gotcha. She had uh, followed up with it's in the ground and she's watering um, every three days and it's city water. Oh, so that's another interesting thought. Um, so every three days is probably a little too much for bananas. Um, they, they need a lot of water, but you might want to um, back off a little on water. Um, and then city water can also have, um, you know, like elevated levels of chlorine and things like that, which actually can do some funky things to chemistry and um, nutrient availability. Um, so you, you may want to um, ask the city, and you can actually just ask the city for um, an analysis of that water. And if once you have that analysis in hand, um, send, it, send it to our office and we'll see, um, we'll see if there's anything in that city water analysis that might be contributing to that. And that's also just a really, really good example um, of all of that information that was just shared about that particular problem. Um, just like going to your doctor, you know, you need to tell your doctor the whole, you know, like kind of like all those details in order to get the right answer. Um, so 
um, when you get in touch with your extension office with questions like that, um, that level of detail is perfect. You know, like give us all of those sorts of levels of details. Um, you know, like, you know, it's city, it's in ground, it's city water, it's, you know, this is where I'm located, this is the issues that I'm seeing, like, go, like spell out as much details as you can. That's super helpful for us because we will, we will ask you those questions anyway if you don't give the information to start with. Okay, the next question is, given soil conditions in our area, which I believe this is a Sarasota resident, okay. we will, as homeowners, be in a constant cycle of applying fertilizer to make our lawns and landscapes stay healthy? Was that, so the question is, will you be in a constant Yeah, will you cycle? have to be in a constant cycle of applying fertilizer? So, so this is another, another one of those, it's, it depends kind of questions. So um, once you start um, really, once you really start fertilizing plants, um, they are, they, they become more and more reliant on what you provide them and less and less reliant on creating all the associations in the soil that they would have otherwise. Um, and then that being said, if you left grass in our area um, to its own, um, you know, totally to its own devices, um, you are not going to get a very thick um, green, lush, um, year-round, poofy lawn, like is really normal around here. It's going to revert to something that simply looks different, right? Um, and so if, if what your HOA requires um, or just your general, you know, sense of aesthetic requires is that really quintessential um, fluffy, green, lush Florida lawn year-round, um, you probably will have to be feeding that lawn. Um, but if you know if you can if you can kind of um, back away from that a little bit, um, just doing things like um, uh, when you when you or your landscaping crew mows mows the grass um, instead of having all that um, all that grass bagged, um, put it on the mulch setting so that all those grass clippings go back in you know into your lawn feeding back into soil. Um, so the way we've kind of, you know, as a society, and I don't really understand why, but as a society, we've decided that it's a good idea to um, always remove, right? Like we remove all the leaves, we remove all the grass clippings, we remove, remove, remove. But though, but that's, you know, if you think back to that picture of the forest and how it's, it just cycles itself and it doesn't need anything, by constantly re removing what our systems are, are feeding itself, the system can't feed itself anymore, right? So those grass clippings and those, um, and the dead leaves and things like that, they contain what those plants need. And if we just let it feed back in, you get a system that does start to build on itself a lot better. Um, you know, you know, and so much of the soil that we're working with as a starting point in the really developed parts of Florida, um, you didn't even start with topsoil because all that got removed to build subdevelopments and it was backfilled with um, with subsoil. Um, and that's a really hard thing to start start building um, all these good associations with. Um, it's possible, but it takes a lot of time and your HOA may be really cranky with you in the, in the interim years. <laughs> so yeah. More questions? Yes. If I get my soil tested today for a raised garden bed, how often do you suggest to get it tested moving forward? Um, it's a good question. It depends, you know, so if you are really happy with what those results say, um, you know, if you're like, hey, look at that, I've been doing something really well all this time and there everything looks good, you know, and the pH is good and the general nutrient levels are good and this is what I've been doing for years and it appears that I've hit on a good combination and you feel comfortable with that then you know, maybe one time is what you need. Um, but if you know that you just perennially just really struggle, um, like the color of the leaves just aren't right. And you know, like, th like things just don't seem to be what they, what they should. Um, it, it may be a good idea to test once a year, um, see, what's, see what's going on. Um, Cause some of these changes really take a lot of time, um, especially down here with our really sandy soil. Um, you have to really, really, really intentionally keep on the process of building up the organic matter levels in your soil. Um, you know, if you, if you add a good load of compost this year, you know, give it a year or two and all of that compost is gone, gone. It's, you know, it's, and there's no more left. Um, and so you're going to be back to that really low organic matter level, which means that those, um, uh, 
all the, you know, the soil nutrients are just not going to be sticking around in your soil as much. Um, you know, and if, if you're trying to um, change the pH of your soil, you know, like if you're starting with pH that's really high or, or really low, um, that's a really slow process. Um, and it's not one that you can ever really stop. Um, it's much, it's, it's a much more laborious process to bring soil pH down. So if you're starting with a pH of like eight and you want to bring it down to like a seven, that's a much harder long-term process than bringing pH up. Um, but both of them are kind of a, a lifetime um, commitment. And so every few years at a minimum, checking to see where your pH levels are um, is, a, is a great idea. Um, you know, and so, and, and just another note on pH also is that pH wants to be what it is, right? So, you know, like down, down in this area, you know, for example, the, um, that, that soil test that we looked at in the very beginning with a pH of 4.7, 4.7 is what that soil wants to be in that spot. Um, so it is, it is you against, um, you against nature, <laughs> you against the, the actual, um, oh my goodness, I just blanked on the word, um, people who study soil, um, geology, there we go. Um, it's you against the geology of that spot on earth um, to try to pull that pH forever up, you know, and so if, if your whole property, you know, maybe you have a whole acre and you had intended to plant that entire acre in, you know, in, in vegetables, um, and your pH is 4.7, um, that's a heck of a big pro project. You're going to do much better picking plants that actually like a really low pH. You know, things like um, maybe you become a, an azalea grower um, or blueberries, something that really likes that pH. So part of it is also like once you know what your soil pH is, that gives you a lot of information to help you actually match up what's going to grow well there. Um, and there could be huge variance on a very small property of pH. Um, there was a property that I was on recently. I mean, it, it wasn't a small property. They had about seven acres, um, but we tested five different sections of that property. And they had a soil pH on that seven acres that ranged from 4.7 um, all the way up to 8.5 on a seven, seven acre piece of land, right? Like that's huge, huge variance. And so even from one side of the yard to the other, you may have a really big difference. And so that might help you decide what you plant where, what you plant where. Okay, great. Any questions? Yes. What other commercial products are good for adding nutrients to your soil? That's a great question. Um, so other commercial products for adding, for adding nutrients, is that right? Is it nutrients or, or organic matter? Sorry, yes, it's for nutrients. For nutrients, yeah. So you know, we already talked about um, you know things like um, you know bottled seaweed or um, co compost, those sorts of things. Um, you, I mean, you certainly can't. It's it's a very you know personal decision whether or not you go with a you know like a, a naturally occurring plant, plant or animal based nutrient source or a conventional like synthetic source or somewhere in between. Um, you know, so if you if you are interested in sticking more towards that natural side of things, um, things like really well composted manure can be really helpful because that that is really helping to add to the organic matter of your soil as well. Um, but the same, um, and, and you can sometimes buy um, uh, composted manure in really large quantities. You can also buy it bagged. Um, there's all sorts of companies that that sell composted cow manure. If you're buying it in bulk, um, again, just make sure that um, the um, the horses or cows that were pooping it um, were not eating anything that had been treated in the last two years with a persistent herbicide, because that will actually um, still be um, very effective herbicide by the time it, it comes out um, of the composting system even, um, which is pretty wild. Um, and then, you know, for things like bagged or other kind of liquid fertilizers, um, there's all sorts of um, all sorts of plant and animal based fertilizers. Um, if you're going the you know the the plant and animal based nutrient route, um, sometimes reading 
reading the back of a, a bag can be a little startling. Um, you discover that a lot of those bags of natural fertilizers have things like um, bone and blood in them um, and fish meal and feather meal and other things that sound quite disturbing. Um, but they are actually a very, um, they're very effective um, fertilizer and they're a very slow release type of fertilizer. Um, so they, um, you know, instead of being available all in one fell swoop, like a lot of the synthetic fertilizers are for plants, they much more slowly release out the nutrients that they're holding. Um, and that, that's, you know, like in, in places with really sandy soil can be a double-edged sword. Um, in places um, with clay, so really, clay, you know, with much more clay in their soil, um, those tend to be um, a very effective kind of fertilizer because it's just, they slowly release out in little bits at a time, which is the same pace that plants like to pull it up. Um, and then, um, you know, you can also do, um, one, of my, one of my favorites to give plants a little boost when they need it um, is, um, it's an absolutely vile, vile substance called um, fish emulsion, which is literally like a rotten fermented fish liquid goop. Um, it smells just as bad as it sounds. It looks just as bad as it smells um, and plants love it. Um, they pull it right up. Um, and, um, you know, so when I, you know, especially when I started farming down here in Florida, I was like, oh, wow, you know, like I, I need to really adjust how I think about the pattern that I'm providing um, plants nutrients because, you know, I'm, I'm used to being able to just, you know, give something a little bit in the beginning of a season and the soil holds it just fine and the plants get what they need, but down here it just doesn't work as well like that. And so I, um, I will often use fish emulsion um, to give plants a little boost when they're going through a part of their life cycle that requires a lot of energy. So, um, for example, um, producing fruit, you know, so that, that actual process of producing fruit, so like tomato, cucumber, watermelon, um, that takes a huge amount of energy for the plant. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of on par with like the amount of energy it takes to produce another human life in your belly, right? Like it takes a lot of energy. Um, it's a, it's a full-time job. Um, and so plants need, they just need a little extra during that, that part of their life cycle. And so that can be a really effective way to give them a quick, a quick jolt of what they need. Um, and it's organic matter also, you know, it's, it's ground up rotten fish <laughs> in a stabilized format. Um, and, it's, and it is very stabilized. Like you don't have to um, worry about it sitting there and you know, rotting and making someone sick. I mean, you cer certainly do not want to eat it. Um, it is the type of thing that my dog loved um, rolling in. Kind of gross. Um, so, okay. Wow, well, uh, that sounds interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it's gross. I, I saw, saw a question pop up on the chat, um, the name of the fish fertilizer. There's actually quite a few different brands. Um, if, you, if you just plug into your, um, you know, your internet search engine, um, fish fertilizer or fish emulsion, and I will, I will type in emulsion. I am not a great speller. Um, I think that's how you spell it. If it's not, there's either two M's or two L's. But I think that's how you spell it. Um, different regions have different brands. Um, you know, you can even get um, fish emulsion or fish fertilizer in like the big box stores. Um, and you just, you water it down. It comes out gloopy, gluggy, really nasty. And, um, and you water it down like in a watering can or something like that and water your plants with it. Um, you know, and so, you know, so it, you know, regardless of what source you get your nutrients from, um, if it is a commercial product, um, it, it's really important to follow the directions on that bag. You know, like I, I, um, more is not better. Um, and that's to me one of the most important take home messages when you're thinking about soil is that we, we have this, um, uh, this tendency to think that, well, if a little bit of fertilizer is good, then a lot of fertilizer must be good, um, but it's it's not. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that um, that go wrong when you over fertilize plants. You know, one thing we mentioned before was um, you can increase the salt level in your soil. Um, you can um, you can actually burn the roots and the and the um, the microbial life that's in your soil. So that's you know that's a total shooting yourself in the foot scenario. You don't want to burn those two things up because that's what's actually feeding itself. Um, and then, you know, especially in areas with really um, sandy soil, um, those nutrients just, they just 
pass right through. So not only are you, um, you're really wasting money because those nutrients are not staying in your soil. They're just, they're passing right on through that zone of leaching. Um, but those nutrients then pass through that zone of leaching and they keep going down and they end up in our water systems. And then we get excess nutrients in, in water. And that has its own very large ripple effect. So whatever source you use, um, you know, follow the directions. Um, and in Florida, you often have to kind of adjust back a little bit, you know, instead of fertilizing, you know, a couple times, you may want to break that, that fertilizing up into four times, each of which is a little bit less than you would normally fertilize. Yeah. Other questions? And yeah. I think that I was actually, I think that last slide that I was on was, I think the last slide, um, unless anyone wants to see resources. So we can just keep going with questions. Okay, great. Actually, someone uh, wrote that they actually put fish emulsion on their plants and the armadillos loved it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have never had to tango with armadillos. Um, I, yeah, I also put fish emulsion directly on leaves of plants that really need a big boost. Um, I've never had trouble with critters and um, that's unfortunate that armadillos tore up your garden now <laughs> afterwards. Hey, oh. Um, next question is, I'm thinking of vermicomposting. Is it okay to put the bin in shade outside or is it too hot here in Sarasota? Yeah, you definitely can put it outside in the shade. Um, just make sure it is solidly in the shade. Um, you know, and if um, it's also a good idea to, if you, if you can, get your hands on a very light colored vermicomposting bin set up. Um, and for those of you who don't know what vermicomposting is, it's a composting system that you, you very intentionally add a particular kind of worm to. Um, so you are literally feeding worms. Worms, um, worms break down um, all of that fresh organic matter into, um, you know, like a decomposed organic matter format. Um, and their poop um, worm poop is very eloquently called um, worm castings. Um, it's castings and poop are one and the same. Um, <laughs> but um, it's, a, it's a great way to quickly break down a lot of material into a format that plants really, really love. Um, and so if you, excuse me, <coughs> I need to drink some water. I've been talking too long. So if you can have that, um, that worm composting bin um, you know, outside very much in shade where it never gets hit by direct light. Um, even with that combination, if you, if you can get your hands on a light colored bin, that's a good idea. Um, you know, or maybe cover it with some sort of light colored tarp would be, would be great. Um, and then one thing with, a, um, with outdoor bins is just making sure that um, they're sufficiently covered that when we get a heavy rain down here, it's not going to flood. Um, you can actually drown the worms, um, which is not good. Um, so, you know, some, something like um, something like a, a tarp that fully that fully shades over your worm bin can do double duty with making sure it doesn't flood, but also being another layer of protection from the sun. And for those of you who are northern growers, um, the kinds of worms that you usually see in worm bins, um, you can they won't survive the winter outside. The winter will, will take them out, um, but you can actually um, dig out some of those worms from your worm bin and bring them in for the winter and do like a little modified indoor worm bin. There's also lots of commercially available intended to be indoor worm bins um, that are pretty neat. They take up about the same amount of space, like same amount of um, square footage on the floor as like a kitty litter box would. Um, and then they stack upwards. So they're like a vertical bin. They're pretty neat. Okay. Very cool. Other questions? Yeah. Um, okay. When planting shrubs and trees, is it better to just backfill with native soil or add bagged planting soil or fertilizer? Yeah. So in, in general, um, I really like backfilling with native soil. Um, and I'll mix in some, some compost and some, and some fertilizer, but like actually like incorporate it um, instead of having it as its own distinct layer. But having, yeah, backfilling with native soil generally is a really good idea because ultimately that's where it's going to live, right? And you, and you want to make sure that as it establishes, it's establishing in, into the environment that it has to get used to. So if you plant it into like, you know, just compost, the root systems of those newly um, newly planted plants, they don't really have much of an incentive to reach out beyond 
that wonderful compost that you just planted them in. And so that can actually stunt root development because they have everything they need right there in that little ball of compost in that little root ball that you just planted them in. So making sure that they have, um, they have a reason to reach out um, the, the, those root systems have a reason to reach out and look for what they need. Um, but, you know, also babying them a little bit because you are putting them through a major stress. So mixing in some compost so that they do have something, something good to start with. And making sure that you also start with soil that's, that's quite wet is really important also because transplant is an incredibly stressful thing for plants regardless of the size of the plant. Tiny little vegetable seedlings or, you know, big root ball trees, it's the most stressful thing that will ever happen to a plant. Okay, and do you recommend root washing when planting trees and woody ornamentals? I don't. I, um, I, I break them up um, and that's like, you know, but that's also like not my, not my specialty. Um, so there, that might be a good question. Um, Actually, Katie, will you, do you mind capturing that question? Um, and we can follow up with the asker with Marguerite. Um, I can tell you like what I personally do, but um, that's, not, that's not my background so much. Um, but I don't, I don't do root washes. Um, and actually, let me, let me get a clarifying question too, because there's kind of two different ways that people use that term root wash. Um, are you, is the, is the asker of the question referring to like a root drench of like liquid nutrients or like actually washing off the soil that the plant came in? Because I've heard, I've heard those two scenarios be both used with that term. Let me make sure I'm answering the right question. <laughs> those are great questions and I don't know the answers to them. Uh, oh, Washing off soil. Okay. Yeah. So I, I don't wash the soil off. Um, I never have. Um, I've, I've heard, I've heard that some folks do do that. Um, but, um, you know, that I, I definitely though, when I'm, when I'm transplanting, you know, shrubs or trees or things like that, I, as much as I can, I break up that root ball because um, it, it tends to be fairly compacted sort of um, sort of root mass in there. And, it, and that's, that's another reason that, that the root systems have trouble actually reaching out into that native soil um, is because if they've been grown in a pot, um, they, they tend to be, you know, or, or tied up in burlap, they tend to be really, um, really dense and kind of spiral. So sometimes it's okay to damage those roots so that they can then branch out. So I don't wash the soil off, but I do really like kind of wrestle with the root systems. And in that process, a lot of the soil does come off and that's okay. Because you wanna make sure that the roots are able to really reach and by necessity, they, they will lose a lot of their soil. But we can ask, we, our coworker Marguerite um, would have a great, um, a great answer on that one. And um, I think Emily, yes, Emily did, um, are you in Florida? So to make sure we're giving you a regionally appropriate answer to things. Oh, Cape Cod, great. Okay, so that might actually might not be a great question for Marguerite. Um, we'll ponder that. We'll connect you with someone who can who can answer that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Next question: When planting near the beach in sandy soil, is it okay, or is there a rule of thumb for applying topsoil or top dressing with bagged or bulk topsoil? So, planting near the beach is um, really, really hard. There's not a whole lot of things that will grow well. Um, so, if you're planting directly into native native soil, really near the beach, um, you um, actually I need to close the chat box because I'm distracting myself. I see. I see chats popping up. Um, there we go. Now I can just see faces. Um, so um, I'm sorry. Will you ask me that question one more time? I just lost. I just distracted myself entirely. You're totally fine. It's a lengthy <laughs> one. When planting near the beach or in sandy soil, is it okay or is there a rule of thumb for applying topsoil or top dressing with bagged or bulk topsoil? Thank you. Um, yeah, so planting near the beach in general, growing, growing most things near the beach in general is just challenging um, because of salt spray, because of um, salt water intrusion coming up through, you know, through the soil. Um, you know, I know when I, I was actually, I grew up in coastal South Carolina and you would dig down about three inches and you'd hit salty water, you know? So it was, you had to be really, really careful about what you were planting well, where, and we had to really build our garden spaces up, um, you know, like, like a whole foot 
in order to get it out of that salt water zone. Um, and then um, just the amount of wind you get really near the beach also is also really hard for plants. So, so yes, you know, like if you're, you know, a, a really, a really helpful thing to do if you're in those um, like near the beach sort of environments is add, um, is add a lot of organic matter into your soil, like compost and things like that. Um, in Florida, and I'm not sure where this, this, um, this question is coming from, but in this area, really close to the beach also means a very high pH, typically. Um, not, not always, but typically a very high pH. Um, so that's another, that's another element that's just really hard about growing really near the beach. Um, and so a lot of folks that live quite near, um, near salt water end up um, gravitating more towards planting in really big pots um, where you have a lot more control or, you know, or raised beds or something like that, where you have a lot more control over um, what kind of water ends up um, feeding your plants, um, you know, pH of your soil, your soil's ability to hold on to organic matter. Um, organic matter breaks down really quickly, really, really quickly near the beach. Um, so um, there's actually some really neat products um, that were developed in Florida for some of the really unique issues that we have with growing in some of these coastal areas. Um, and um, I didn't go into it at all today, but another really, really, um, really tricky thing that we have um, to deal with down here in Florida and a lot of the southeast are a particular kind of um, microbial life form called nematodes. Um, not so much of an issue in, in northern places. Um, I'd never encountered uh, um, a plant parasitic nematode until I moved to Florida. I was like, what in the world is wrong with these plants? And I learned really fast what was wrong with these plants. Um, it was a microscope, microscopic worm um, drilling into my plant roots. So raised beds can actually be really, really tricky down here. They, they solve a lot of issues, but um, nematodes, which are one of the hardest things about growing in Florida, um, love raised beds. And so they, they make, um, they, can, they can really complicate um, successful growing in raised beds. So if you are growing really near um, uh, like a beachy sort of area down here, there's, um, you may be, you may be better off with um, products like um, Earthbox is, um, it's like a self-watering, self-contained planter that was actually developed in Florida to deal with a lot of these conditions. Um, there's some other products on the market really similar um, that can be a really good idea. They're not cheap, um, you know, so if you feel, if you feel really committed um, to growing in a, in a raised container sort of scenario, um, you know, you gotta, you have to decide if the cost, um, if the cost makes sense for you. And that question came from a CS to key resident, just so you know. Perfect. Yep. That was a, that was a good answer then for CS to key. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Okay. Where would I find a list of plants that can live in Florida organized by their preferred pH levels? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, it is possible. Um, and any of my coworkers that are on this call, do you know if the Florida friendly landscaping guide has that? can't remember. Um, let me grab, let's say, got one right here. I can't remember if this has it or not, but this... What, what was able... the question? Oh, Wilma's on. Hey, Wilma. Um, yay. W Wilma, Wilma is the, the number one person in our office who would have the answer to this. So um, the question, Wilma, was, is there, is there a list of plants that grow well in Florida that's organized by... Um, pH tolerance or pH preference? The, the book there does tell the pH preference for all the plants that are in it. The key's on page 31. Um, and they can get that online through Swift Mud. I don't know if Swift Mud's in their offices yet, or once we're back in the offices, they can come in and get a free copy. And we also have um, a link for where they can download the the copy online. Awesome. And I'm typing the name. There we go. So that's the name of the book. Um, and um, Wilma, who is, thank you so much, Wilma. I'm really excited that you were on this call because you were the person who I knew would have the answer. <laughs> um, but um, Wilma is our, um, our amazing and wonderful and beloved Florida friendly um, landscape person in our office. Um, and um, she probably won't like me saying this, but she's brilliant. Um, she, um, 
she's pretty incredible at navigating plants in our region of Florida. And I ask her all too many questions. <laughs> she is a wonderful resource. We are very lucky to have her. Extremely, yeah. Then Other next, questions? Yeah, the next question is, understanding each situation is different, how much time each week should we spend adjusting our soil? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, that's a very, that's an interesting question. I've never quite thought about it from that perspective before. So, so when I think about, it's like when I, when I approach managing soil um, in any kind of growing scenario, whether it's, you know, a 20 acre field or, um, you know, a four by four raised bed, um, I like to kind of think about it um, on a couple of different levels, you know, and one is like, you know, what do I intend from this space in the long run? Um, you know, is this a space that I want to continually having turnover of annuals, you know, where I'm constant every year I'm harvesting vegetables, vegetables, vegetables out of it. And so vegetables that you're harvesting out and eating, you're obviously not putting much back into that system, right? So with a system like that, I think a lot more about how I manage that soil and I'm much more active in how I manage that soil than I am with something like a native landscape, right? If I'm planting a native landscape into native soil, um, I, don't, I really don't have to think a huge amount about it. You need to put some really good forethought into it as you're designing and planting and establishing. But then the theory is that you don't actually have to do a huge amount of maintenance um, with that soil. You have to do a little bit, you know, because, you know, it's ultimately still a landscape and we're, we're asking something to be something that it wouldn't normally be, um, but much less, you know, and so for something, um, and actually I might have Wilma time back in if she's willing to talk about, um, yeah, like how often, Wilma, would you be willing to quickly address how often you think about and navigate um, soil in a, native, in a native landscape? And if not, it's okay. <laughs> Recognize I'm putting you on the spot. There she is. Oh, you're on, you're on mute, Wilma. There you go. Yeah. Um, repeat the question. So the question was uh, how, like, how often do you have to like actively be um, uh, like on top of like creating, tending, interfacing with your soil? And so I'm kind of breaking it down into like two different systems. One is like with native landscapes, like how often do you really need to be like actively engaged in your, in your soil in a native landscape? And then I'm going to address a little bit of like, you know, in an annual vegetable scenario. Well, in native landscapes, probably not near as much, but it, it would depend a lot on the plant. A lot of native plants will grow really well in really, really poor soil, but when you start looking at the plants individually, a lot of them like organic matter. So it, it depends on the plant. Yeah. Yeah, and so thank you, Emma. Um, you know, and so for like an annual vegetable system, I know that every year, regardless of my soil type, I do, you know, at, at a minimum of every year, I need to be feeding something back into that system because I'm constantly taking something away from it, right? Every time I harvest something, I've taken something away. Um, and so in an annual vegetable system, you know, every single time I plant something, I'm putting, I'm putting something back into the soil. And it may be, you know, for something like tomatoes, it's in the ground for a long time. And it's, you know, it's, it's taking so much energy to produce that fruit. I'm probably having to put some supplemental nutrients in two or three or four times while those tomatoes are growing. Um, so, you know, it really depends, depends on what you're, you're growing. Um, so, you know, in general, annuals, um, annuals that you're taking out um, and not putting back into the system is gonna require a lot more of your time and intervention than a perennial plant of any sort. Hopefully that, that gives a general yeah. general idea. That was great. Great. And it looks like we've got, oh, it's actually after four. I'm happy to keep answering questions for like another 15 minutes or so, but I realize we've already overshot um, our, our two hour time frame. So I keep answering questions for like another 15 minutes for anyone who wants to stay with us. Um, and for those of you who need to tap out, um, I just want to say a, a really quick um, thank you so much. Um, 
for giving me the opportunity to talk about soil. Um, I absolutely love soil and um, I hope that this has given you some inspiration to learn more about soil. It is, um, you can actually get your PhD in soil. Um, so there is an absolute endless amount to learn about soil. And I encourage you to dive on in there, get your hands dirty and do some good reading. Um, so thank you. We will send you a follow-up email. Um, one of the things it's going to have is a, is a survey um, that just is going to ask you some questions that helps me measure how much you learned, like how much knowledge you started with and how much, um, how much knowledge you ended with. Um, and that's really important for me as I develop classes and do reporting. Um, so, um, and we'll also send some, some um, additional information um, so other, I'm, I'm happy to just keep answering questions. That was my, that was my thank you. So anyone who needs to go, go for it and I'll just keep answering. Of course. The next question is going to be, um, this webinar has got me thinking about purchasing an outdoor compost bin. Do you have a suggestion about what type to get? There's so many different types. Um, there's like so, so, so many different types and they all have their benefits and their drawbacks. Um, it would be great to talk to other folks in your area who have had experience with different types of bins. Um, some simply do better in some areas than others. Um, some of them, like if you're in a very urban area, doing some sort of composting bin that um, is fairly um, critter proof, um, you know, like things like um, rats, in urban areas get into outdoor compost bins. Um, and so making sure that if you are doing an outdoor compost bin in an urban area, um, you're getting one that is really well rated um, for rats and raccoons and things like that. That's, that's just a reality in urban areas. Um, and then, um, lar so one of the keys to good, good composting is, um, is a good like a good mass of material. Um, compost really doesn't get quite to the the level of heat that you want it to until you get about a three foot by three foot mass of material. Um, and so a lot of um, commercially available compost bins are actually smaller than that, and so they just never quite heat up right. And so they don't they don't break down very fast. And then you might get some stinky scenarios, and your neighbors complain and things like that. Um, but um, yeah, so I would do some asking around. Um, if you are in our area, like in the, the southwest coast of Florida area, um, we actually have a compost, an outdoor compost bin demo at our office site. Um, and the park is open again. Our office is still not open, but the park that our office is in is open. So you, you can go look at compost bins if you want to. There's maybe, maybe half a dozen different designs out there, including some vermicomposting. Um, and something else I was going to say about that. Oh, there's also one of our coworkers, Randy, um, Randy Penn. He teaches some really fantastic um, home composting classes called Black Gold. So if you go to our Eventbrite page and, um, and look for Black Gold composting classes, that's a great way to learn about different kinds of um, compost bins. And um, yeah, that's, I think that's probably a good summary on that. And, um, and actually, I saw a question pop up that I want to show for those of you who are still online. Um, do you know of any apps that can inform you the type of soil in your area? Um, so there's a part of that presentation that I was, that I did for y'all that, um, that I didn't show you. And I'm going to show you some of this really quickly. Um, there is an excellent, very complicated, oh, this is something I, mean, I need to send out to all of y'all. This is the most amazing YouTube, most amazing instructional video, incredibly inspiring on health I've ever seen. So this is something I need to send to everyone who was on the call today. Um, highly recommend it. Um, but okay, so this is the app. Um, it's actually um, through the NRCS, that Natural Resources Conservation Service. It's called the Web Soil Survey. So the Web Soil Survey um, is basically the digitized version um, and there's the home page of their website, so you can see it. It's a digitized version of all of the soil surveys um, across the entire um, United States. It's an incredible, incredible resource. It is also incredibly not intuitive to learn. Um, but if you can learn to navigate it, you, it unlocks a huge amount of information about your, well, that was something different, about your, uh, about your soil. Um, and if you are not particularly tech savvy, I would recommend getting someone um, who can navigate really confusing, convoluted, um, very unobvious websites to give you a hand. Um, 
It is, um, oops, let's see, I'm gonna type into the chat box, web soil. So if you just Google web soil survey, it'll pop right up. Oops, looks like I sent it to only one person somehow. Send to, I don't know how that happened. Let's see, there we go. Um, yeah, it'll tell you all sorts of things about soil. Um, it's not gonna tell you, like if you have like a quarter acre yard, it's not gonna be able to tell you down to the level of detail of what's happening in every, you know, every corner of your quarter acre yard. But it tells you, you know, like a generalized, so like, so early, earlier when I was talking about that, that property that had seven acres and their soil test came back with a pH that ranged from 4.7 to 8.5. And we were like, what in the world? One of the first things that I did um, after thinking that something had gone wrong with the soil tests was actually pull up that soil web survey and take a look at what the, the naturally occurring soil types were on their property. Turns out on this single property, they had five distinct soil types. And based on where they were in that particular part of, of Florida, um, particular soil types, particular region, that information together gives you a, a normal range of what pH might be in that area. So it turns out they simply were at this really odd intersection of five different soil types that had five really different distinct um, pHs as a natural range. So it was actually not a mistake in, in, so in testing. It was just that they truly had that big of a range in a very small space. Yeah, but if, you, if you're on really tiny acreage, um, it's, you know, it's going to be hard to like really zoom in and learn, you know, like on a, in a very micro level about your, your particular plot, but it'll give you a really good idea of all sorts of things about, you know, maybe the the general soil types on your block or your neighborhood or something like that. Okay. In your opinion, how good is peat moss? So peat moss is complicated. So there's a few different things to, um, to think about with peat moss. Um, one is that it is mined out of bogs. So um, it is, um, I have used peat moss for years as part of potting soil. And it's something that in the last few years, um, as I've learned more about peat moss mining, um, I have really gravitated away from. Um, peat moss forms in, in bogs in very acidic northern realms of our world um, over very, very long periods of time. So within our, within our lifetimes, peat moss is not a renewable resource. Um, it is, you know, over generations, but not not the way we're using it right now, um, and not in a single lifetime. Um, so it's also extremely high in acid. Um, so if you already have um, very acidic soil, um, adding peat moss is is not really going to help you. Um, the the biggest reasons that people add peat moss to their soil, um, one is um, peat moss is, is great at holding. Um, holding water, right? It, it helps to, it, it's, it is, it's organic matter. So it acts like a sponge in your soil. And um, I saw layered lasagna garden. I'm, I need to stop looking at the chat while I'm trying to talk. I'm getting all sorts of distracted. I'll show you that picture um, in just a second. Um, and then um, peat moss also, because it's organic matter, does do a good job of capturing some of those nutrients. Um, but um, you know, it also just, there, there, it has a lot of issues as well. Um, and when you're dealing with peat moss, if you are using peat moss, um, you got to be careful because it's, um, it's so dry and, and dusty um, that you want to really get it good and watered down before you start to work with it because you can, you can inhale it and it's a, it's a lung irritant. Um, so you got to be careful with that. Um, so, you know, I, I tend now to, to um, be drawn more to products like coconut coir, C-O-I-R, um, which has a really similar set of benefits. Um, and I'll type, type that in. Oops, wrong button. Um, it has a really similar set of um, benefits to um, as peat moss, um, but it, you know, it's not mined. It's a byproduct of the coconut industry. So coconut coir. It looks really similar. Um, you know, it, it's a really similar function. You can also buy it in all the places you would be buying um, peat moss. All right. And then lasagna garden. I'm going to pull, pull that up. You can ask me another question. I'm just pulling up a picture. Okay. Do you like fabric pots for vegetables? 
You know, I've actually never used a fabric pot before. I've always been curious about them. Um, and, um, but I like, it's one of those, like, I don't see why not. Um, so and I'm, I'm curious, whoever asked the question, um, and actually there's so few of us on the line now that if you want to unmute folks, that's totally fine. Okay. And people can actually use their voices. <laughs> um, and um, and I'll I'll just um, show this picture really quickly because it was um, this was a question that was asked and then we'll come back around. So um, the, the oh was that a picture of lasagna gardens? Oops, I muted. Nope, you're good now. Sorry. Okay, great. Um, was that a picture of lasagna gardens that they saw on the screen? And for those of you who don't know what a lasagna garden is, the basic idea is that you layer up different kinds of so of organic matter. Um, so, you know, things like manure, um, compost, um, grass clippings, leaves, you know, any, anything, seaweed, stuff like that. And you layer it up and then you let um, natural systems decompose it. You let all of those soil microbes and, um, you know, and um, soil life like worms and, and beetles and insects break it all down. Um, and it and it's a really so if you if you this was actually a, a classroom demonstration idea um, to actually do that but put it in a fish tank so that your that kids in your classroom can see can actually see it happening. Um, you would obviously have to probably add in some worms and things like that to the system because um, they're not going to just all of a sudden appear in your fish tank. Um, but this is a this is a great way to build organic matter um, just in you know outdoor garden spaces also. But this was a picture of um, a fish tank demonstration of um, of layers of organic matter and being able to watch how they break down. Okay, so the question, um, who asked that question, Katie? Not not the lasagna garden, but the yeah. the, um, the fabric pots. The fabric pots was, if I remember correctly, I believe it's Emily. Okay. Emily, do you have you had experience? If if it was indeed you, um, have you had good experience with fabric pots? Yes, I have both of them: earth boxes and fabric pots. A Great. bit of financial outlay at the beginning, but they last for years and years. And in my northern, uh, well, New England climate, I need to put my vegetables where the sun is, <laughs> and yep. it's usually by my driveway. Um, and so I recommend them highly use a very good quality potting soil in Great. Them and keep the moisture enough, but another way to grow annual vegetables. Awesome. Thank you. Emily, you're a Cape Cotter? I am. All right. <laughs> Dandy soil. I, that's why I love this Florida. Uh, yeah. It's, it's all about my kind of soil. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. When I, all those years I farmed in Maine, it was mostly just rocks. Yeah. Farmed in a whole lot of rocks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Other questions? That was actually the last one that came in. So unless awesome. there's other questions out there, which you're free to put in the chat box, then I can unmute you. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. If they want to find out more information or contact you, how would they do that, Sarah? Um, we will, how about this? We will send my contact information in a follow-up email. Perfect. Um, and um, see, so yeah, you can see my name on the screen. So if you want my email address immediately, um, it is my, my email address is my first and last name. So Sarah Bostic at UFL for University of Florida. So Sarah Bostic at UFL.edu. There we go. That's a much easier way to do it. I don't know why I've been telling people to use the chat for the last two and a half hours and then I didn't. <laughs> Your emails in the chat, and then we'll also include that in the follow-up email to everyone as well. Yeah, that's great. Thank hey, you, Katie. Sarah. This is, this is Sarah. You. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, segue from from gardening to uh, landscape or turf. Um, is there actually a way to build up organic matter in our turf by doing a just a thin topsoil um, distribution? Yeah, that's such a good question. So I, I'm a huge fan of the mulch function on lawnmowers. Let that grass mm -hmm. drop right back where it is, um, you know. But like, it's also just gonna like our soil just doesn't hold on to organic matter very fast. And so, yeah, you know, some you know, like occasional um, 
applications of, you know, compost or topsoil, things like that. Um, and, you know, and unfortunately, so many of the grasses that we like to grow, um, they, you know, they just, they have large nutrient requirements and things like that. And that's part of what keeps them so nice and lush and green. Um, but that also just means that, um, you know, to keep up with, you know, HOA requirements and things like that, sometimes we, we have to feed, feed things yeah. um, in ways that we wouldn't otherwise. But yeah, you know, so that mulch function, um, you know, it, and if, if instead of um, instead of bagging your grass clippings, um, that also obviously means that you have to mow relatively frequently so that you don't smother your grass in grass clippings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I already, I always, I've always mulched my grass, and awesome. I don't have the hay. I don't have Saint Augustine <clears throat> to to my HOA's demise. Um, yeah. <laughs> But I was just wondering if actually adding, you know, a, a layer, a thin layer of compost would actually, would help to build it at yeah. all because I have so many areas of just almost pure sand. For sure. Yep. And, you know, in, in those areas that are pure sand are probably pure sand for a reason. And so you, you'll <laughs> probably have to, you know, once a year, give it, you know, give it some more organic matter. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So, that, you know, and that's, that's the thing, you know, like when we, when we try to change when we try to change a system for what it, uh, from what it, from what it is, like what it is naturally tending towards, um, it's almost never a one-time intervention on our part, right? Because we're, you know, it's, it just, it just isn't. It's like get, getting a haircut and then assuming that's the only haircut that we're ever going to need in life. Um, so it's like that idea of, you know, if you want a particular hairstyle, like you got, you got to, you just got to keep up you just got to keep adding to it, you know, because otherwise that's, that's not naturally what your hair would look like sort of thing. And it's just, it's a really similar sort of idea with any sort of natural system that, um, that we're trying to change for some reason, you know, whether that be for a particular kind of lawn or because we want to grow, you know, vegetables in it, or, you know, or trying to get a, a, a tree established that wasn't already there. Um, because we are doing something that what wouldn't otherwise have happened um, had we just left it alone, we, we just have to stay involved in it um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that we wouldn't otherwise. Yeah, good perspective. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Anything else? I think that's it. Awesome. Sounds great. Cool. Well, thank you all so very much. Um, I'm so glad to, that so many people tuned in today. And um, it's always a wonderful surprise when people want to stay, um, stay even longer and keep talking about a particular subject. Um, and this is one of my favorite topics for sure. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, we, we do lots and lots of classes out of our office. Um, everyone, everyone in our office um, are tremendous teachers and um, love the subject matter that they talk about. So check out our Eventbrite page, um, see what else we have coming up. And um, I wish you all well with your, your soil pursuits um, and have a great afternoon and feel free to get in touch about anything. <laughs>